you could see there that the quadricep appears to have three parts, the outer, the middle, and that inner part there. We call that the teardrop muscle, okay? So we're going to find out what the muscle actually looks like, what it does, where it connects and all that, and uh, find out what would be the best way to work this muscle. So uh, in this illustration here on the left, um, specifically this, this part right here, what you're seeing here is the three parts we just saw on my leg there. What you're not seeing is this part right here. This lies underneath these three, specifically underneath that middle one. This is called the vastus intermedius. This is what that would look like if that didn't have this one that goes all the way to the top here. That's called the, the rectus femoris. So if you look at this right here, this group of three muscles, excluding the rectus femoris, starts at the top of the femur, crosses the knee joint, and connects right there to the upper part of that tibia bone, okay? So since it does not cross the shoulder, excuse me, the uh, hip joint, it does one thing. These three muscles do one thing and one thing only. They straighten the knee. They extend the knee. That's all those three muscles do. That's all they can do. They don't cross the hip joint. They don't cross any other joint. They can't influence any other joint. So three quarters of the quadricep muscle does one thing and one thing only, leg extension. What is the main exercise that we typically use for, quote, quads? Barbell squat. And things like barbell squat, meaning hack squats, uh, 45 degree leg press, things like squat, compound movements, right? So let's look closely at whether or not this is a good exercise for the quads, specifically, because that's what we're talking about here. It also works the glutes, and we'll talk about that on the next segment, but since they overlap a little bit, we'll talk about that a little bit here. Squats do involve extension of the knee, so there's a green check, and it does involve extension of the hips, so there's a green check for that. So far, I'm not saying whether or not it's the best version of knee extension and the best version of hip extension, but it's important to know that those two things are present and they're essential for working the muscles that we want to target. However, it also involves loading the erector spinae, which isn't necessarily good, and it also involves compressing the spine, which is doubly not good, all right? Neither of those last two things, neither loading the erector spinae nor compressing the spine are necessary for loading the quadricep, maximum stimulation of the quadricep. There are other better ways of doing it. They're not part and parcel. In other words, it would be wrong to assume that you, if you didn't load the erector spinae, you're not going to get maximum quadricep stimulation. Or if you didn't load the spine, you're not going to get maximum quadricep stim stimulation. Okay, so if you have a 33% active lower leg lever, which is operated by the quadricep, that means that you're getting a 67% reduction of the amount of load the quadricep could get if you were able to use a more, a fully efficient, a horizontal lower leg lever. So here's the one that was hiding. I've seen uh, illustrations where it starts a little higher, but usually the short head of the bicep femoris starts somewhere around the middle of the femur. The long head starts all the way at the ischial tuberosity, goes all the way down. They both merge, and they both connect with a single tendon right there on the outside of the fibula. That's the smaller of the two lower leg bones. Okay? Now over here we've got the semimembranosus and the semi semitendinosus. Um, they kind of overlap each other, but they both start side by side at the ischial tuberosity. And they come down here and they connect to the outer part of the tibia. All right, so what I want you to see here, this is a, a better illustration where you can see the origin of these three parts. And there's the little part where the short head starts, right? Between the joint, excuse me. Um, makes the gluteus a significant primary hip extension muscle. Here's the hamstring. Here's the hamstring. Does not cross the hip joint, right? So, yes, when you bend over and you raise the ischial tuberosity, you do get a stretching effect, right? But the much more powerful hip extensor muscle is, 
is the is the gluteus. It cannot possibly be the hamstring, right? It's just mechanically impossible. It assists. It certainly assists. But to assume that you can build your hamstring by doing deadlifts assumes that it plays a major role in hip extension, and it does not. It does not play nearly as major a role as does the deadlift. Let's find out why. Here, you can see that I'm raising my right leg straight, right? And I'm doing that to show you that there's an automatic rounding of the back that occurs. And the reason for that is because when you raise your leg up like this and the knee is straight, the hamstring stretches. The hamstring stretch causes a deactivation to some degree of the hip flexors because they're opposite each other, right? And that causes you to compensate by rounding your back. You, you sense the weakness, you're trying to get the leg up higher, and you end up raising the leg up higher by rounding the back. <laughs>